It's the Hero Show. Everybody, welcome to the Hero Show, starring the indestructible John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing today, John? Oh, I'm great. How are you doing today, Andy? Good. Good. I was just noticing, I, I think this is a minor thing, but I was just noticing in, in our otherwise beautiful setup and everything, there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a delay, a little bit of a time lag, you know, in the, you know, when, when we speak. So, we, you know, we simply have to, just, we simply have to be aware of it and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it because we're talking about heroes, right? Yeah, such is the nature of the beast here. So uh, we apologize if we occasionally speak over each other. Got a, a, a comment about that. Um, yeah, we get it. But uh, this is the technology we've got, and we're going to use it to discuss some of the greatest people in history. And maybe someday we'll talk about the great people that create the technology that we're relying on right now. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the technology overall is really, really great that we're using. A little bit of a time delay in our speaking is, you know, is a minor is a minor issue get, given the virtues yeah. we, we have here. And I think the, the great man that we're discussing today, you know, m morally flawed hero, I would, I would say, and I, of course, you know, I just happen to have a copy of a hero book here, where has a chapter on morally flawed heroes. And we could discuss, you know, we're discussing William Wilberforce, right, who, who uh, politically... Um, and we'll, we'll, let's make sure we give Wilberforce's dates. They were a uh, 17 fit William Wilberforce, because uh, I want to say something at the end, John, about Samuel Wilberforce, one of his sons. But uh, William Wilberforce, 1759 to 1833, uh, the, man, the man politically in Parliament most responsible for abolishing the slave trade, and he fought a decades long war uh, uh, against. And this is and, and and triumph. This is such a great achievement. You know, makes him a hero. Even though some of the other things he did in his life, I think you know, were not heroic and were and, and were very negative. But I, but I think you know we're focused on on the life advancing achievements of heroes. We will mention and deplore the bad stuff, but we're going to focus on on the you know what makes what makes William Wilberforce here. We're definitely going to focus on that. Yeah, he certainly wouldn't be on this show if his flaws weren't far, far, far outweighed by his contributions. Yeah. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. We, you know, we should uh, we sh we should mention, you know, that he um, when in the when he when he was a member of Parliament, uh, he, you know, he he became friends with people like uh, Thomas Clarkson. You know, was a, a leading anti-slavery advocate. And later on, uh, the banker Henry Thornton. I, I think he was with Thornton for a while. You know, one, one of the leaders of what was known as the Clapham sect in in, in Clapham, uh, England, outside outside of London. And uh, you know, uh, he became he became convinced. And, and he, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Didn't he go to college? Wilberforce go to college with William Pitt the younger, when they became friends yeah. when they were when they were in college. Yeah, he met the great William Pitt the Younger at Cambridge. Uh, William Pitt was a very studious fellow, and Wilberforce was not. You know, he had an interesting childhood. Uh, his his father died, I think, when he was about nine, and he went to live with an aunt who was an evangelical Christian, and Wilberforce became a very uh, you know staunch evangelical. And when his mother caught wind of that, his mother was a member of the Church of England and not uh, too happy about her son becoming this religious enthusiast. And so he, she brings him back and says, you know, no more of that. Cut out, cut, cut out the uh, evangelical stuff. And he begins sort of a life of partying, which he brings with him to Cambridge and, and really is amplified there. He's pretty uh, heavy drinker, gambler. He's son of a, you know, his grandfather was a wealthy merchant. So he's got lots of money and he's at Cambridge and he meets Pitt and the two uh, in 79 start attending sessions of parliament together. You know, something fun to go. Let's, let's go check out parliament. So yeah, that's where he met Pitt. Well, yeah. And it makes sense. I, I mean, given their interests, Pitt, a future prime minister, 
and uh, Wilberforce, of course, a future MP or member of parliament for decades. So you know, it makes sense that part of their their shared interest was was politics. And and you're right. You know, my I got the same same results in the reading I, I did on Wilberforce. That uh, Pitt was very studious, and Wilberforce was was not. And so so it made for uh, a, a little bit of a you know the odd couple here. But nevertheless. Uh, you know, Wilberforce certainly, you know, as, you know, now, we were saying this last week, you know, what somebody does in their youth is not necessarily an indication of what they're going to do as, a, as an adult, you know, and there are any, uh, you know, um, you see, we were discussing Pasteur, we saw it with Pasteur and now with Wilberforce, they may be a little bit dissolute, you know, in, in, in their college days, I mean, there's a lot of that going around. But they mature, they emotionally mature and go on to go do very, very serious work and do, uh, you know, become, become real heroes. And Wilberforce, uh, certainly, certainly in, 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 uh, in politically, in politically leading the charge against the slave trade is, is, is certainly a great hero. In incredible, yeah. And so um, Pitt's father was a politician and, and Pitt was already very much decided on a political career and convinced Wilberforce to join him at these sessions of parliament, which is when Wilberforce, you know, really became interested in political career as well. And uh, actually got elected to parliament even before Pitt when he was 21 in uh, 1780. He was still a student at Cambridge. Um, back then it was common to spend a great deal of money. I guess it still is to, uh, you know, secure your seat in parliament. I think he spent something like, 8,000 pounds to, uh, to become an MP. And, uh, and then, you know, his first several years in parliament, he did a, a few notable things. One, he and Pitt really, um, were very outspoken opponents of the war with America and criticized the, the war as bloody, cruel, and useless and, uh, criticized the politicians that were spearheading it saying they're just furious madmen, not able statesmen. But he was still a pretty dissolute guy, even for his first five or so years, maybe a little less, maybe three years in, in Parliament. Um, it, it, he'd frequent these drinking clubs, these gentlemen's clubs, and they have just such funny names we have to mention. Goose Trees was one of them and, and a few others. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, from there, he, you know, he um, took a trip through Europe with Isaac Milner and drank deep of the evangelical creed once again and you know his his focus shifted in life and he sort of cut out the the drinking the gambling and uh there's a great 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 quote from a uh, philosopher thomas reed he said that men should rush with violence from one extreme without going more or less into the contrary extreme is not to be expected from the weakness of human nature and I think this kind of sums up what happened here with Wilberforce. He went from being this, as you said, dissolute kind of guy that really wasn't doing too much to a very focused, uh, very, very, very uh, conservative Christian. And he saw as part of his Christian mission uh, abolishing the slave trade. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's the next step in Wilberforce's right. development. Right. I think it was 1785 when Wilberforce comes back to the evangelical uh, Christianity that he had flirted with in his youth, this time for good, for better and for worse, as, 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 as we shall see. Uh, and, you, and, you, and you're and you right. You used the term enthusiast before. We should, we should make clear to the audience. That's a great term. That was the term in the 17th and 18th century during the, the age of reason and the Enlightenment. That was the term they used for what we call you know, zealots or, or fanatics. He was, a, he, was a, he was a religious enthusiast. Yeah, an evangelical. He was, a, he was an evangelical, and he and he's, it was morally mandatory to spread the word, you know, uh, to, to war against all these horrible things in the world, slavery being one, but also, as we shall see, some, you know, some things which are just gone in variety vices, you know, like what was it, like, drinking and you know, th you know, think you know, things like that. But, but you know, uh, the slave, the slave trade. He meets Thomas Clarkson, Granville Sharp, 
some some of the uh, the leaders of of the British anti-slavery movement, 1787, I uh, I think, and uh, and and Clarkson, we have to give <clears throat> we have to give give Clarkson some some you know a lot of credit here also, because Clarkson did an enormous amount of research on the slave trade and the horrors of you know the the Middle Passage, you know, and uh, I forget the numbers, but something like of 11 million slaves shipped across the Atlantic, you know, over, you know, over this time period, it was, it was well over a million that didn't make it, who died, you know, in passage because the conditions were, were, were so horrific. And Clarkson was a great guy for facts, figures, evidence, data, you know, and he did all his research and uh, had, had all this information at his fingertips that he could, uh, he could feed uh, accurate, not, not propaganda, you know, truth that he could feed to uh, uh, Wilberforce, who obviously was a, you know, a, a politician, was a member of, of parliament. And that was enormously uh, useful to Wilberforce's political campaign against, against the slave trade. Yeah, Clarkson really was uh, one of the big brains behind this operation. If he did the research, Wilberforce was really the, the mouthpiece in parliament. Um, James Boswell right. later said of Wil Wilberforce, I saw what seemed a mere shrimp mount upon the table, but as I listened, he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. Just remarking at Wilberforce's incredible ability to speak on the floor of Parliament, and a, an ability put to use, really making the case that that Clarkson largely brought to him. You know, they would meet regularly, as you mentioned, the Clapham sect, uh, also became known as the mm -hmm. Saints. And uh, right. the, this entire group of people came together and would discuss this stuff. And Clarkson was the guy that was traveling around all over England and elsewhere, uh, picking up the stories, picking up the facts and, and really doing this heavy, heavy research. So he, right. he deserves right. ample credit. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and we should make we should make a, a couple of points here uh, that yeah, evidently Wilberforce was a, a slight you know, figure. He was he wasn't a robust, you know, uh, physical specimen. And he was sick. He was sickly throughout throughout much of his life, which is you know why Boswell he, he said you know he was a shrimp. Uh, but his great or his, his great oratory and on behalf of a noble cause uh, made him morally uh, like the size of a whale. And we should we should also point out to our our viewers, John, that uh, James Boswell, of course, famous. Literary figure and uh, you know famous you know in, in literary circles as the bio as the biographer of Sam of, of the great Samuel Johnson. So you know Boswell you know was, it was Boswell was a famous famous writer at at the time. So he, he has a certain he has a certain intellectual credibility when he when he lords you know when when, when he lords Wilberforce's moral uh, the 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 moral power of Wilberforce's oratory. Oh, by the way, I should just say what one. Last thing, later on, one of William Wilberforce's sons, Samuel Wilberforce, and 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 maybe and maybe one of Wilberforce's other other children wrote a an account of uh, of this struggle against the slave trade, which emphasized their father's role and de-emphasized uh, Clarkson's role. And uh, Clarkson was justly irate at that, called them out on it, and they 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 you know gave some half-hearted apology for you know. Uh, trying to minimize Clarkson's role in the in, in this, but yeah, Clarkson Clarkson also is a, a, a moral child. You put it nicely. The brains behind this operation and uh, Wilberforce is the political spokesman. Not to minimize Wilberforce, he was a powerful political fighter this, for for twenty years, from seventeen eighty seven when he got converted to the cause, you know, to to, to end the slave trade to eighteen oh seven when it finally was ended. Uh, they, they, it's a real study in moral indefatig indefatigable you know perseverance I, I i mean they overcame so many obstacles well before us uh overcame so many political obstacles to finally abolish the slave trade they say when in 1807 when parliament voted to abolish the slave trade one member of parliament after another got up you know in, in support of this and 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 praise Wilberforce for his indefatigable role in this, and that they said the tears were just streaming down Wilberforce's cheeks as you know as, as this as the bill was being passed in Parliament. Yeah, time and time again, he brought these measures to Parliament, and and 
they just lose, you know, at first by huge, huge margins. And then as the years right. stretched on right. by less and less, but still a loss is a loss and they, they weren't making progress. But he'd give these remarkable speeches, just moving speeches. And over time, more and more of the public really bought into this cause and started to elect others that were also in favor of abolition. And, and that's really what it took. Um, it, it took a widespread public movement in support of abolition to elect more people to parliament. A lot of them were ex-military. They'd been abroad. They had seen the horrors of slavery themselves and they supported his measures. Right. That's right. And we should point out 1787 to 1807, this 20 year moral crusade against the slave trade. Look at some of the political impediments. I mean, a little event like the French Revolution just happens at this time, right? in 1789. And of course, revolutionary France and later Napoleonic France, you know, go, uh, they're at war with, with Britain. And you know the radical ideas of the of the French Revolution are associated with with the abolitionist movement, whether you abolish the slave trade or ultimately the institution of, of slavery itself. And so, you know, a sort of conservative backlash, uh, you know, against the abolitionist movement that had been picking up speed prior to the French Revolution. Kind of backlash occurs in the 1790s <laughs> that curtails. Uh, the abilities of Wilberforce in, in Congress, to, um, Congress in, in Parliament to get the votes. So he's overcoming all kinds of obstacles, you know, from the planters, you know, in the in, in the in the Caribbean, you know, to to uh, uh, the enemies of of the French Revolution, uh, you know, and, and so on and so on. So there's all all kinds of uh, and you know and, and certain intellectuals who thought and writers who thought that. Uh, slavery, morally, you know, this this argument unfortunately goes back to Aristotle that that you know slavery morally improves the slaves by bringing them into contact with a superior civilization. In this case, in this case, Christianity. There are all kinds of obstacles that that, that uh, Wilberforce and his allies had overcome, but they they never gave up. That's that's the key to to the, this great achievement here, right? Is the in a salute. Uh, Wilberforce and his was John. They never gave up. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting irony too that Wilberforce in this this movement became associated with revolutionary France because Wilberforce was staunchly against uh, revolution in general. Uh, you know, he he was somewhat sympathetic to the French Revolution, but his conservative side uh, was. It was anti-revolution. In fact, he supported Pitt's uh, gagging order, which uh, you know gagged critics of, of the government. You know, not one of the honorable things that Wilberforce or Pitt did. Uh, he supported orders that kept groups of fifty or more from congregating. Uh, he was anti-unions. He called unions a disease. I don't like unions either, but I think people should be able to form them. Uh, so, you know, he did a lot of things that, you know, in retrospect, were not at all in line with this, this idea that he you know, was a Jacobin, you know, as they called him, Andy. Right, right, right. Wilberforce was a, a uh, on most issues, was a moral and social conservative uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, profoundly enthusiastically religious. You know, uh, and and there's a, there's a great deal of bitter that goes with 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 the sweet uh, here. Um, but I but we're going to focus on the, the 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 positives here, and we'll just say a few things about the the, the negatives later. I just want to point out, you know, it's different. It's interesting. You know, my our, our good friend Eric Daniels, uh, who of course you know is a PhD in American history. Uh, yeah, Professor Daniels said to me once. You know, a great quote, I'll never forget. He said, he said, history is messy. You know, it's got all, this, you know, all these conflicting or even contradictory elements pushing in different directions and there are different tributaries that come together to form, you know, uh, uh, the mighty Mississippi, you know, a, 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 a mighty river. Uh, and one of, the, one of the tributaries contributing um, to the anti-slavery crusade, both you know, against the slave trade and against the institution of slavery itself, was Thomas Paine's book, The Rights of Man. It was published in the 1790s. 
And if I remember correctly, it's been a while, but if I remember correctly, Payne's book was dedicated to George Washington and, and, the, and the Marquis uh, de Lafayette, great heroes. So we're, gonna, we're certainly going to discuss uh, you know, that later on at some point in, in, in the show. And the rights of man, uh, uh, late, late 18th, turn of the 19th century, sold uh, many copies in, in England and contributed to uh, anti-slavery members of parliament be, being elected. I bring this up because uh, we got, when, we, when we get to the negatives regarding Wilberforce, uh, Thomas Paine is going to figure into this. But they were allies, you know, re regarding uh, the anti-slavery crusade. I don't want to point out because I'm, you know, I'm an admirer of Thomas Paine. He explicitly, you know, uses the terms in individual rights and, you know, was personal, was personal friends with, with Thomas Jefferson and, uh, you know, and, and, and they, they, they overtly, you, you know, use that terminology. Uh, so, you know, these, these guys, these guys were, whatever their flaws were, um, Jefferson, of course, a slave owner, whatever their flaws were, these, these, these guys were, were real heroes. And this, these different streams coming from secularists like Thomas Paine and, and for religionists like, like William Wilberforce, you know, come together to form this powerful uh, abol abolitionist, um, you know, movement. And this is one last point I want to want to make on this. When I was doing the research for the for the uh, Capitalist Manifesto years years ago, you know, I was doing all, all this research in 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 British history because that you know, Locke and and Britain is the cradle of uh, of individual rights. And one of the one of the historians made very clear. As he put it, you know, Will, William Wilberforce. You, you remember, Wilberforce was born seventeen fifty nine, right? This, this is the Enlightenment. We were in the same period, seventeen eighties. When, when he's meeting with Clarkson and Granville Sharp and you know and, and eventually Henry Thornton, this, this is the same period when when Priestley and the uh, Lunar Society of Birmingham, you know, are meeting as we as as we discussed earlier. One of the historians put it very nicely: Wilberforce was well aware of Enlightenment thinking on you know on on the issue of slavery. That the philosophs, the leading thinkers of 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 the Enlightenment, Voltaire, as you know, as as one example, you know, were, were strongly uh, anti-slavery based on the Enlightenment principle of the rights of man or the individual rights, you know, as, as Thomas Paine refers to it. So Wilberforce, uh, we got to give the ev evangelists credit here. The Quakers were, you know, on the forefront of the uh, abolitionist movement. But I think the intellectual foundations were laid by the, by the secular thinkers of the Enlightenment and, you know, and their, their philosophy of, of, the, of the rights of man. No doubt. Yeah, that, you know, um, in fact, I believe Wilberforce's first speech in Parliament invoked this idea of inalienable rights. And um, you know, he, he made his argument on the moral high ground that really was uncovered by these Enlightenment thinkers, these thinkers, these free thinkers, many of them, they, they uh, deists like Benjamin Franklin and even Thomas Jefferson to some extent. So, yeah, he's definitely, I think you're right, Andy, he's definitely building off this case laid by his forebears like John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, and even, as you said, Thomas Paine. So there's a great irony there. Yeah, as, as, we, as, we, as we shall see. Um, the, the irony grows uh, more, you know, stronger, stronger and, and stronger. But yeah, it's interesting with the abolitionist movement, that that somebody like Thomas Jefferson, who was theoretically like a lifelong uh, abolitionist, you know, who believed that slaves should be emancipated, uh, you know, by degree, uh, Jefferson trying to avoid the seismic sundering of civil war that he was that he he presciently you know foresaw would you know tear the nascent republic apart. But he but the the, the irony there, of course, is. He was commit Jefferson committed to abolitionism uh, as as he, he would have to be given the staunch support of individual rights he was and yet and yet a slave owner uh, right up until until his death uh, if I remember correctly I don't think he even I don't think he even freed his slaves at at, at his at his death so history is messy uh, as Professor Daniels said I think the reason history is messy is that people are often inconsistent and Jefferson was hypocritical here. But his principles uh, were right. His practice was wrong, but his, his principles were right. 
And you can see the abolition. Here's, here's, here's the greatness. You really want to give two, you know, two thumbs up in this regard to the, uh, to the British and, the, and their, you know, their colonists in North America uh, who founded the United States of America. Whatever, whatever the flaws of Britain and the United States, uh, you know, and the, the British supported slavery for a long time, the, the brutal mistreatment of the Irish, horrendous, the slavery in the United States for a long time. Uh, we, we, all, we have to point out the full historical context here, John. Slavery has existed all over the world, throughout all time, everywhere, uh, you know, throughout, throughout all of history, uh, and still exists today, you know, legally, you know, in any communist country, North Korea, China, the former Soviet Union, but, hey, but you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and of course, in, in North Africa, in, in, in Sudan, for example, because Islam, you, under Islam, you can't enslave a co-religionist. But, you know, infidels, John, infidels are fair game. And you can enslave the, non, the non-believers in the thousands and thousands today as we speak, you know, black uh, 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 Sudanese uh, slaves, uh, but many of them, many of them who, who are Christians. So, you know, ab- uh, slavery is, just has a long and, and, and horrific history and it's still go, uh, going on legally in many places. The sex trade, of course, is a form of slavery, but that's illegal, uh, in, in, at least in, in, in all the civilized countries. But anyway, slavery is legal to this, to this day in, in parts of the world. And we got to give the credit here to the Brits. Uh, this is where it's, you know, Enlightenment Britain, where the, where the first organized abolitionist movement arises for the first time in history. There had been individuals prior to 18th century Britain who opposed slavery, the Roman Stoics, for example. But there was no concerted, organized abolitionist movement until 18th century, turn of the 19th century, Great Britain. And we see the confluence here of these different tributaries. Again, I think the Enlightenment is, is, the, is the foundation with the rights of man doctrine or individual rights. And to their credit, a number of religious denominations, the Quakers in particular, and also, uh, you know, str- uh, strong evangelicals like like William Wilberforce, you know, and uh, uh, Henry Thornton and the, the Clapham set, they pick up on the, those individualistic principles and they are just indefatigable, indefatigable in the political struggle and, and the cultural struggle in writing pamphlets and giving speeches and everything uh, in the struggle against uh, the slave trade and eventually against the institution of slavery. We've got to give the Brits a lot of credit here and their, and their American counterparts uh, across, across the pond. And you mentioned the great Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Paine and John Adams and, and even the Virginians like Thomas Jefferson theoretically opposed slavery while they were, while they were still slave owners. So uh, you get the Anglo-American culture here is, well, the British in particular, the British, uh, they get, they get a, a great deal. They, they should get a great deal of moral credit. This is, this is a heroic crusade uh, uh, against slavery. Uh, and you know, give them you know, a big round of, 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 of applause. So that's what I got to say on that, John. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you think about the, you know, the, the, British, the British did a good day's work here you know, uh, uh, on this issue? I, I think that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and it doesn't end in 1807 when they become the first nation to abolish the slave trade. Uh, of course, uh, in America the clause in the constitution that says nothing can be done about the issue of slavery for the the first 20 years expires while jefferson is in office and one of the great things he does is he he uh he tells congress you know i'm expecting a bill on this on this topic i'm expecting you guys to send me a bill that i can sign into law to get rid of the slave trade in america as well and i believe it was actually signed before the bill in britain if i recall correctly but it went into effect afterwards. Uh, but, you know, America is right, right on the heels. And right. This, this abolitionist movement in England also really catalyzes the abolitionist movement in America. In fact, it freed up some of the abolitionists in England to come to America and, and actually uh, support the cause here. So huge right. motivation, a huge push came from, from this English abolitionist movement. 
And Wilberforce's story, of course, doesn't end in 1807 with the abolition of the slave trade. He continues on. You know, I wrote an article on, on Wilberforce in which I called him a monument to perseverance because after this 20 year battle to end the slave trade, he, he continues. So, you know, for a time, he's of the mindset that, yeah, if we get rid of the slave trade, gradually slavery itself will dissipate and we won't have it anymore as well. They'll just, you know, just sort of wither and fall to the wayside. Over the years, he and, and others in the movement come to recognize that this gradualism isn't working and a new crop of abolitionists starts to arise. Wilberforce is getting older, he's aging, he's had horrible health his entire life. Uh, and he starts to mentor others. Uh, Thomas Buxton, I believe, was one of them who he asked in 1820 to take over the movement. But Wilberforce is continuously active in the movement, continues to give speeches. Uh, there's uh, a society that's formed for the abolition of slavery itself. And he, he continues to chair meetings, to give speeches, even in parliament. Um, in 1824, I believe it was, he gave his last speech arguing against uh, slavery in general, just to get rid of the entire institution. And, um, you know, he, he then retires, his, his health is failing, but he continues, even in retirement, to fight against slavery right up until just the, the month before he died, he gave his last speech against slavery. Uh, so you want to take it from there, Andy? Yeah, I, I um, just wanted to point out that, uh, going back to what you was building on what you were saying before, John, that uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote into the Declaration of Independence, right, a, a clause to abolish the slave trade which unfortunately was, was stricken out by, you know, the Continental Congress. <laughs> That's not funny, but I'm, I'm, I remember we were discussing uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, and, and we do have to do a show on, on Jefferson. But you know, you, Frank, one of the reasons Franklin didn't want to, didn't want to be the lead author the, you know, of the DOI, he said, Tom, you're a better writer, you go ahead and do it. <laughs> he, he, he hated being edited by, you know, by the, the, the Committee of Five or, or, or anybody else. And of course, Jefferson had his, it's not funny. I had the clause, you know, to abolish the slave trade. It was 1776. Uh, had it had it stricken out by um, by Congress. I mean, yeah, yeah, by the, the and the Committee of Five. But yeah, Jefferson as president, absolutely, is one of his one of his notable achievements. Signs into law the, the bill abolishing the the, the slave trade. And um, coming back to Wilberforce, a prime mover here. Uh, yeah, well, my, a monument to perseverance. Yeah, indefatigable. I love it. I love it, John. Uh, continues the battle, even though he's dying, mentoring others, uh, um, speaking where and when he can. Um, and finally, it was 1833, Parliament abolishes the institution of slavery itself throughout most of the British Empire. And it's like, it's like two or three days before Wilberforce dies, right? So he, uh, I, I think he was still, you, you, you're, you're more of an expert on Wilberforce than, than I am, John, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think Wilberforce was still in, in possession of his faculties and was aware of the, of the new that, 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 that Parliament had abolished slavery. And this, this crusade of, his, of his, almost his entire adult life had reached a uh, successful and a glorious fruition. He was aware of it, wasn't he? Yeah. As you said, history is often messy. Uh, the timeline is slightly messy here. So he finds out three days before he dies that there are certain concessions be between members in parliament and that the bill was virtually guaranteed to pass. Uh, he, d he dies three days later before it's actually passed and it's signed into okay. law about a month after he died uh, by the king. But he died knowing that his life's work in large part had been accomplished. You know, that was really the pinnacle of his achievements. Yeah, that is that is good news. I'm glad you know that he was able to see the fruits of decades of, of labor and overcoming extraordinary obstacles. Reminds me of the great British uh, Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton, who said, uh, you know, "Whose survival story in the Antarctic is just is, is it almost defies credibility." 
But uh, we got to talk about him uh, on one show, too. But Shackleton had a great line on this. He said, quote, obstacles are just things to, to be overcome, unquote. Boy, Wilberforce is certainly, he's a, Wilberforce is an exemplar uh, of that. Now, as, a, as, a, as an evangel evangelical Christian, you take the bitter with the sweet. Um, should, should we uh, discuss briefly some some of the moral failings here, and then, then come back and wrap it up with a well, you know with with an ode to uh, the the anti slavery crusade? Should we discuss some of the some of the, the moral failings, the Society for the Suppression of Vice, for example, which even the name of it makes my hair stand on it. What do you, what do you think, John? Should we discuss a little few of the failings here? Yeah, to put it mildly, he was he was sort of a prude. I mean, he went from being this gambling, drinking having fun kind of guy, uh, Madame de Stel said he was the wittiest man in England, to being anti all of that, anti drinking. Uh, he wanted people jailed for not uh, obeying the Sabbath. He wanted people jailed for uh, having brothels. And uh, I don't know what the, the equivalent was then, but the equivalent of, of passing around pornography. So yeah, he, he didn't want people doing any of this stuff. And this was part of what I think in English history is called a reformation of manners. Really, he wanted to reform English culture and to get people to be more moral. And I think in some respects he was successful, but in most he was very, very unsuccessful. His ideas were not popular, um, especially when they involved forcing people to do things against their will. You know, and that, that right. was a big... You know, that, that I think is probably his biggest failing. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's one thing to rationally oppose by means of persuasion, you know, drinking, prostitution, pornography, you know, uh, profanity and things like that. Try to persuade people. Look, you're drinking. This, this, this is eating out your liver. You're going to die. Your family's going to lose you. you know, it's one thing to, you know, to rationally persuade people against uh, you know, let's say in our day, drug use, but to prosecute people, you know, you know, you know as consenting adults for, for, for drinking, not, you know, initiating force against any innocent person, they're, they're just drinking or consenting adults engaging in prostitution. Uh, you, you know, these are things that, you know, I think are properly considered, can be considered vices and, and, and that could certainly be self-destructive. Uh, but these should, right, to somebody who supports individual rights, as Wilberforce certainly does in the uh, slavery issue. These are not issues to be prosecuted by, by the state and the Society for the Suppression of Vice. I mean, to me, the, the most egregious uh, error of this, the, the, the most uh, flagrant violation of, of individual rights is when they, 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 were, they were part of the, of, of the, uh, the uh, they were part of the, the policy here that jail, they put in, they imprisoned the London publisher of Thomas Paine's great book, uh, The Age of Reason. Now, you can see why intellectually, morally, Wilberforce was opposed to Paine. Paine was a secularist. Uh, he, he, I, he, I think he openly said he was, a, he, he was an atheist. Um, he, in, in, in the age of reason, he glorifies the power of reason, he attacks religion and, and faith-based beliefs. And he's got, Paine's got that great line in the age of reason that my own mind is my cathedral and my own mind is my church. I don't remember the exact wording, but it's a beautiful ode to, to, the, to the rational mind. You can see why Wilberforce, as a devout you know, faith-based person, would, would oppose this intellectually. But these are ideas to be, you know, to be battled out in the, you know, on the battlefield of ideas. You, know, you, you, you write in opposition to somebody. You, you debate, you know, uh, you, don't put, you don't put them in prison for publishing a book, especially a great book. So, yeah, that's my, my, my main, you know, boo, boo. That's my main criticism of William Wilberforce and the society, the suppression of vice. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's my main criticism. Yeah, he did write a book, and I think his book was far more successful than any of his attempts with uh, with, with uh, changing the laws on any of this stuff. I think it was called Appeal. Yeah, it was called Appeal to the Religion, Justice, and Humanity of the Inhabitants of the British Empire in behalf. Oh, I'm sorry. Another book title. Don't worry about it. 
But um, yeah, his book actually did have some impact on the culture, but his attempts at legislating this stuff did not, thankfully. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a, it's a good point, Sean. When you reason with people, you, you, I think you, you're more apt to be successful than when you're when you're coercing, when you're coercing them. You know, you you, you know, and I, you know, and, I, and I believe you know to carry this to our day, and our country, uh, that the, the legal war on drugs is a moral failure. It's a, a abysmal practical failure, right? As Ayn Rand points out, the moral is the practical, and the immoral is the impractical. To, I think we should legalize drugs and then reason with people. You know, not only the the destructiveness of of drugs and how they they kill you, but also the possibilities open as a clean liver living in a relatively free country, the possibilities of having a rich and fulfilled life of achieving you diamond you know, an education and productive career and romantic love and close friendships and travel and the arts and you know, physical fitness and sports and there's all these great things you could have in your life and you, and you want to threaten that, you know, but for you know, a few moments of a high, you know, from, from cocaine, I, I think what well, will force or anybody uh, when they appeal to, to you're appealing to the best in human beings, to their rational mind, the rational understanding, and their desire to live. Uh, I think we're going to have better success in curtailing vices, whether it's drugs or you know, alcohol, or these kind of self-destructive uh, activities. Uh, we have better success appealing to the best within people than when we, than when we try to when we try to force them. But we will force animated by religious enthusiasm here, right? He's doing God's work and God, I guess God, I guess God instructed Wilberforce any means necessary to suppress these, these uh, vices, you know, you're doing God's work. So uh, yeah, that was, I think that was a terrible failing on his part, especially being involved in censoring and, you know, uh, uh, great writers like Thomas Paine and imprisoning their publishers. That is truly uh, an egregious violation of uh, an individual's right to, uh, to intellectual expression. So yeah, you know, condemn Wilberforce for that, but we should, we should end on a positive, right? Go back to his great achievements. Well said. Yeah, his, his great achievements, I think, had a far more lasting impact, thankfully. Uh, as we were saying, he really helped to catalyze the movement against slavery in America as well. So not only did his work help to um, outlaw slavery in, in pretty much all of the British colonies, but uh, America followed suit and people took great inspiration from the achievement over there. And, you know, here it, it took a bloody war and it's really unfortunate, but uh, these ideas, these fundamental ideas, they understood thanks to the case that Wilberforce had made and others of course had made that they had the, the moral high ground and uh, right. they took that, that with them and and did right things right right and you know it's a, an interesting point the uh the, the the british by the 1830s had become uh so committed to, to abolitionism you know generally and wilberforce again you know the, the the shining political leader here who gets a lot of the credit that they raised a a, a ton of money to compensate slave owners for you know for the for the loss of their slaves and uh, doing that, especially if people are contributing voluntarily, and I think I think to some extent that that was the case. Well, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Might have been tax dollars, but even even if it's all tax dollars, it's still better than a bloody war if that's you know if that's what it takes to to, to abolish slavery. So to give the give the British credit, so, you know, uh, uh, I want to make a couple last points here, John. You know, we were talking about. Wilberforce being aware of Enlightenment thinking and and so on. Well, he he was personally acquainted with some of the members of the Lunar Society that who we discussed a, a few weeks ago. Josiah Wedgwood, for example, the great potter, innovative pottery maker, designed the medallion, uh, became a, a famous symbol of the anti-slavery crusade of a, you know of a, of a kneeling you know a, a slave with the motto, "Am I not a man and and, and a brother?" You know, and it was, it was beautifully made by Wedgwood and uh, welcomed by Wilberforce. And it, it helped, you know, visualizing th these kind of horrors uh, helps. And um, Wedgwood, Wedgwood cer certainly contributes in, in that way. 
I just wanted to make a, one last point on the families here that I, that I find interesting. Um, that Will, one of William Wilberforce's sons, Samuel Wilberforce, he was, he was Bishop, Bishop Wilberforce. In, in 1860, he has a debate with Thomas Huxley. You know, this is like, it's not really a debate. It's a, well, in 1859, Charles Darwin publishes Origin of Species. I don't know, seven or eight months later, some, some Americans given a talk in, in, in Britain, and there's a whole bunch of notable intellectuals there. One of them, Thomas Huxley, the biologist you know, who supported uh, Darwin, was known as Darwin's bulldog because he was fighting these intellectual battles for Darwin. And one of them was Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, you know, one of William's Wilberforce's sons. And evidently, they engaged in a heated dispute after the talk. It's known as the Wilberforce uh, Huxley debate. It wasn't, again, it wasn't a formal debate. It was just an informal dispute after somebody else's talk. But it's, it's, it, I mean, it's hilarious because, first of all, Samuel Wilberforce was a great speaker. You know, he was, he was, a, he was a great orator. Uh, Huxley, Huxley had evidently said prior to this meeting that he had no problem being descended, you know, from apes or monkeys or whatever. We, we don't have the recordings from, from this dispute because it was an informal discussion. Nobody took exact notes and all we have are verbal recollection. So, but evidently in the dispute after, after some, you know, somebody else gave a talk, uh, Samuel Wilberforce asks rather archly of Huxley, I saw you, are you descended, are you descended from apes on your mother's side or on your father's side? He would say, that's funny, you know, that's, 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 that's funny. And, you know, and Huxley responds something to the effect that, you know, that I'd rather be descended from apes than from a man who uses his great abilities to suppress scientific truth. I also, or, or something of, of that, or acknowledging Wilber, Samuel Wilberforce's abilities and it's chastising him for, uh, you know, for, for trying to suppress, uh, you, know, you know, just taking faith-based beliefs rather than all the evidence, you know, uh, offered by, by Darwin. So <laughs> I think that's an interesting uh, uh, end note here for the, uh, for the Wilberforce family and, of course, for the Huxley family. Thomas Huxley, of, uh, his grandfather of famous novelist, philosopher Aldous Huxley, most famous for his novel, Brave New World, published, I think, in 1932. You know, you know so it's, it's some of these families, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the fa your families obviously go on, and, and, and some of these great families, they continue to have, you know, uh, influence. You know, we discussed, we just mentioned Wedgwood, and we discussed him previously with the Lunar Society and, 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 Priest, and Priestley. Uh, Wedgwood's one of Charles Darwin's grandfathers. Erasmus Darwin, another member of the Lunar Society, a great physician and botanist, was Darwin's other grandfather. And you see, you know, the, the members of the Lunar Society, their, their offspring, or their, their, their grandkid, you know, resulting in great scientific advance with Darwin. You see Huxley, you know, the bi biologist, Darwin's bulldog, standing up for the truth against religious oppression, his, his grandson, uh, Aldous Huxley writes a famous, you know, dystopian novel. Uh, you know, you, 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 the Wilberforce family, uh, Wilberforce, the great abolitionist, his son, Samuel Wilberforce, engaged in this dispute, you know, over evolution. For better or for worse, you see these notable families of educated, brilliant men, you know, contributing to the culture. Um, and in the case of William Wilberforce, his religious zeal uh, uh, leads to some rather bad things. But, John, it contributed largely to his abolitionist uh, fervor, and so we got to give him credit. Give the, we got to give the angels their due, as Leonard Peikoff once said. Politically, uh, the Quakers and the Evangelicals, they were certainly very active in the abolitionist movement, and we salute them for that. Abolitionism is one of the greatest achievements of British culture. Absolutely. Yep. We have to celebrate Wilberforce and, and everybody else that was a part of this huge struggle. And uh, I think we almost forgot to mention that Wilberforce's birthday is on Monday. So that's uh, all the more ah. reason to celebrate Wilberforce right now. Well, 17, 1759. So if he was you know, still alive, he'd be, uh, uh, you know, he'd be even more of a, be even more of a religious miracle, you know, 250 years 60 years later, but um, what would he be, 261 today? <laughs>
uh, if he yeah. was still alive. But yeah, but let's put we can. I think we could end on this note, John. Everybody dies, but will not everybody has a legacy that lives on forever. And William Wilberforce's abolitionist legacy lives forever. Absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. I think we could end on that note. Unless you have anything else you want to say, Bob. Well, I hope you guys are enjoying the show and taking great inspiration from it. I know I'm definitely enjoying enjoying doing it. Uh, please give us a, a five star rating and subscribe and tell your friends about us. And uh, we'll see you guys next week with another episode of the Hero Show. Absolutely, John. May you have a more heroic day, everybody out there. I hope you're inspired to lead more heroic lives, and we will see you next week with another episode on the Hero Show.